On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinold Show, we talk about how to progress loading strategies in our patients. The Ask Mike Reinold Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody. The latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. I am joined by part of my team at Champion PT and Performance up in Boston, Massachusetts. Dan Pope, Dewesh Podell, Lisa Russell, Dave Tilly, Lenny Macrina, answering all of your amazing questions. Did you? Did a bird just fly away? <laughs> I, but I look at our stats, by the way. Nobody really watches the video, by the way. Everybody listens to us, so they don't get to see all our goofiness on time. But, <laughs> but we, we do have a video of this on YouTube and on MikeReynold.com if you ever want to see it. So Dave does shadow puppets. Um, some of us make funny faces at each other. But uh, anyway, something to kind of see. But Len, who do we have for students today? We have a, an amazing crop of students, as, as always. We always have good students at our always great facility, tremendous facility. We have uh, Jonathan Sandberg from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, which I thought it was in St. Louis, Missouri for the longest time. No idea why. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Creighton. Uh, we have uh, Brendan Gatesy Gates from Duke University. Everybody knows where that is in the great state of North Carolina, the home of the Tar Heels. And we also have <laughs> Joey Shrimp Scambia, former catcher from Northeastern University, now a PT student at the University of Rhode Island, Rams. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Creighton still. Can we bring this up again on this one? <laughs> I mean, my my name's not like Reynold. It's Reynold. It's <laughs> E-I is I. It's Cry. I. It's I. I better. Crichton. Crichton. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Are, there, are there multiple ways to pronounce E-I and I-E? I don't know. I'm confused by this, but we're off topic Ladies already. We're just... English with pirates. That was great. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's Rhinold. So cry, it's, yeah, anyway. All right, what, Jonathan, what, 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 do, what do we have other than a faulty university name for a question today? So our question today comes from Ryan from Florida. As a new therapist, I really struggle with lower extremity therapy and loading progressions. Do you have any suggestions for taking a patient from injury to walking to more specifically knowing when and how to increase load to help them reach their goals? It was never really covered in detail during PT school. And it sounds like a basic basic thing. So I feel embarrassed and I don't understand and I don't understand it better. Thank you for any input. So I'm, I'll start off with this, Ryan, is I think many people feel this way. And I think we've talked about this in past episodes, that this isn't like a huge portion of a lot of programs. So uh, I think you should, you know, easy for me to say, but like, I think you should feel motivated to learn this because you have identified this as a knowledge gap that you may have. That's cool. But man, please don't feel embarrassed about this. Like, you know, again, easy for me to say, but this, it's not embarrassing that that you you realize that there's something you can get better at. I think that's amazing. So, so get better better at it learn that a little bit hopefully we'll teach you a little bit about that um i don't think i learned it that much in school either um a lot of it for me was learning by doing right by you in the rehab world like experimenting with loading progressions and how to increase strength in people but then i think the second part of that was the more that i kind of you know worked on being a strength coach and actually working in a strength and performance environment that really helped so Let's start from the beginning, though. So, PT student, early career professional. It sounds like you're 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 early in your career. Um, maybe we'll let's let's start off with Dewesh. Maybe we're going to go right to the strength and conditioning perspective first, which I think is the good solid background. Somebody's coming to you. They just started rehab. They just they just started anything, an exercise program, rehab, and you. H- how do you determine? your loading pattern for that person. So like what sets and reps, how much weight, where do you start? And then how do you start progressing that Dewey? Yeah. So big thing for me is uh, I, you know, first go through an assessment, try to figure out what level they are as far as, you know, in their rehab process or in the performance process. Um, And we try to figure out what the entry point to training is. Right. So one of my favorite phrases that I've picked up kind of along the way 
um, is finding the person's trainable menu, right? We kind of start with that. We figure out, all right, what do they have access to currently? And then we figure out, all right, how do we fill in some of these menu items with the patterns that I find are important, right? So let's kind of focus on the lower body because I think the person asked about lower body extremity ex um, exercises. Yep. So, you know, we take a look at, all right, we have a squat pattern, we have a hinge pattern, we have a lunge pattern, we have a stepping pattern, and then maybe let's even add in ambulation, right? The, the act of walking or running or whatever form of, um, of ambulatory exercises. And we figure out, all right, what's my low hanging fruit as far as things that I know we're going to get big bang for our buck through. And then how do we find ways to load it safely and have them continue to make progress? So, you know, big things for me are, if we're talking about a, a squat pattern, right? We try to keep it early on to something that they can manage staying nice and tall and, you know, being able to kind of bend through ankles, knees and hips um, and find a good comfortable position. We might load it with, you know, two sets of 10, three sets of 10, four sets of eight, you know, whatever we have access to that they can actually manage. And then over the course of time, we might progress load, but decrease the volume, meaning, you know, go down in reps. Um, and then, you know, similarly for, you know, let's say like the lunge pattern, we try to figure out, all right, is a stepping forward lunge a little too difficult for this person? Cause they might have some compensations and they might struggle with it. All right, great. Let's do a split squat, you know, right. keep them in place. We just go up and down on that, on that single leg or split pelvis stance. And then we just, you know, progress that over the course of time. And again, we treated the same thing like the squat. We give them higher reps early on to practice it. And then as they get a little bit more proficient with the actual movement with the exercise and they show that they can load it a little bit more now, right? Now we introduce a little bit more load, bring the volume down so they can actually manage control of that load um, and then so on, right? And you just kind of take that same concept for your, for your hinge. You know, you can even take that same concept for your ambulatory exercises, right? We might start with like easy, moderate loading sled pushes if you have access to a sled, right? And then maybe we kind of turn that into a little bit more like treadmill jogs or and then sprints. So there's definitely ways to kind of progress that. We just got to find out what their entry point to training is and then pick low hanging fruit that we can get a good training effect out of while keeping them safe and keeping them progressing. I like that. And I like how you started off by not just jumping right into like throwing load on somebody, but what you're trying to do is find which like progression or regression of a movement pattern is most applicable to them. Right. So again, say a lunging pattern, right? Like you, you know, you, we determined you don't have enough strength or stability or experience with this movement that you don't do it so well. Let's just do a split squat, right? Let's regress the exercise make, and make it basic. I like that. Um, who else, Dan, what do you do? Or, or, I thought I saw Dan uh, you know, raise up a little yeah. bit. Sorry. You, obviously you too, Dave, but like, so what do you, what do you do in the rehab mode? Like somebody's come to you, they have knee pain. I don't know. Where, where do you start with them? Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's actually, I think this is one of the most powerful things we can do as physical therapists. So learning about this is important. I'm actually doing a whole series of seminars on, I call it stress dosing. I don't have a good word for it, but that's essentially what we're doing. We're trying to figure out where someone is in terms of their injury. And we're either kind of increasing that dose of stress, decreasing whatever we need to do. Um, what's kind of nice is that for certain joints, we can figure out how much stress we're putting on the joint. Let's say the knee is a pretty good example. And uh, we'll use the example of, let's say, a squat. I know you were talking about walking, but we know from a physics perspective, it's kind of funny because I took so much physics as I was growing up, but I don't think I ever had the dots connected well enough mm -hmm. from physics to like actual physical therapy, but it becomes super important. So the deeper I go into a squat, the larger the moment arm grows from my knee to my center of mass, the more stress goes on my knee, right? And the more my knee comes forward during a squat, the same thing happens, the more stress goes through the knee. So if I'm trying to increase stress on the knee with something like a squat or a split squat, I can just translate my weight forward, drive that knee forward, and I'm increasing the stress in the knee. If I want to decrease that stress a little bit, I just shift my weight backwards, right? It's one of the reasons why if you're a personal trainer and you have someone with knee pain and you want them to decrease some of that knee pain and you tell them to squat with the hips back, usually the knee feels better. And I remember back in the day when I was a trainer, I didn't really understand why, um, but it's pretty simple. If you understand those biomechanics, you can decrease some of that stress. So for someone that has knee pain, <coughs> It's a little bit different for someone who say post-surgical, because for those folks, we have to follow a pretty specific protocol, but you give them whatever they can tolerate at the time, right? And then pain comes into play. 
pain for a lot of injuries, let's say it's more of a, a tendon issue, patellar tendinopathy or patellofemoral pain issue, we know we can push through a decent amount of pain. So I think part of it is that when you do the evaluation, you have to little, know a little bit about the pathology. So let's say it is knee pain, and then you try a bunch of movements to see what's tolerated best. And you try to give them pretty much the hardest exercise they can tolerate well. And over the course of time, as they tolerate more, you just add more and more and more. A couple easy ways to do this, and Dwesh talked about it, is we can increase the load, right? We can increase the challenge of the movement, so having that knee translate forward a little more, deeper into a squat, uh, more knee dominant motions, like a step up as opposed to a single like a deadlift, and then we can increase the speed, right? So if you're moving super slowly, it's less stress through the joint. If you move faster, it's more stress through the joint. So really there's so many ways to do this from a program perspective, but what we're trying to do is manipulate some of the stress in whatever way you'd like, load, speed, movement, whatever, there's a lot of options. Yeah. Even volume frequency. I mean, all those things actually kind of play into it. So, um, I think that's, I think that's a, a good way of doing it. And I think what I like what you kind of said right there, when somebody's in pain, I think the first thing you want to do is you want to determine what's an acceptable amount of pain. So whatever, let's say it's three, four out of 10. Right. And you have to establish that and then find what loading strategy does that. And I think that's a great way to start with this. If you're doing something and they, they are having no issues with it and, and they're breezing through it and they have no discomfort, some pathologies like a tendinopathy, maybe you can deal with, you know, a two, three, four out of 10 pain. You, that's probably a sign you want to load a little bit. So, uh, yeah, uh, Dave, you uh, did you have something you wanted to add? I saw you kind of say something. Yeah. I mean, it was, my points were kind of summarized pretty well. It's, it's a funny yeah. story because I vividly remember the time that I decided. I needed to learn more about this was actually I flared up somebody's cuff because I didn't like have a great exercise progression of mine. <laughs> I the course after that like that was like all right I need more of this and I think it I, obviously there's no worse feeling as a clinician when somebody comes in they're like oh man like I definitely like I feel crappy like I think we did too much like I'm not getting better like it's a terrible feeling so it's what you do with that after like do you do con ed or do you just keep like blasting ahead and be like nope I think we're fine just keep going so <laughs> my two cents are is learn the strength conditioning and learn what exercise progressions like Dan has some really great graphics about like the spectrum of hip dominant versus is knee dominant exercises and you can do a high bar back squat with somebody and know that's more hip dominant and take some pressure off the knees and how do you work up through like you know a trap bar deadlift up to like an actual front squat that's really important to know because on the fly you can adjust those exercises if someone's having discomfort but also you can program for them more specifically of what they're going to have limitations around and two is i think you mentioned it mike is like there's some good studies that show that you know under a three out of a ten out of uh you know pain is, is a maybe a tolerable limit depending on the pathology and i think the important thing is educating people about like you're probably going to feel some discomfort here but like as long as your pain is not worse the next day after significantly and it goes away within 24 hours or reduces back to its baseline we're probably okay in like a yellow light system so i think that that's really important for to educate people on what what's that tolerable level because most people like you know we've talked about before just have disuse or you know discomfort associated with exercising that's a normal response and they think it's pain from their injury yeah i love that that's great uh lisa what else um, I, I'll say this is one of the biggest things I feel like I'm continuously learning from all of you. <laughs> um, I'm still working on this, right? Like I don't feel comfortable with this for the most part. I mean, unless, unless like, I feel like I've already been there with somebody, but I feel like this is one of the things that I, when I'm thinking of something I want to do with someone, I either kind of like check in with, you know, one of you guys or, um, you know, or, or, or create that conversation because it's, it's tricky. Um, and I, I'm definitely still learning that. So I, I, you guys are my resources there for sure. <laughs> I, 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 you're right though. I mean, it's a lot of this we learn through experience, right? It's, there isn't a magic like, like course you can take necessarily, you know? So I do think there's some con ed, right? You can study up in the strength and conditioning literature, like exercise fizz, maybe, you know, sit for your CSCS. I think that'll be helpful. Right. Uh, Dewey, what did you have something on that? Yeah, just the last thing that popped into my head that could definitely be helpful, and it's something that I preach to our interns all the time, right, is just having two things. One, having a really good system that organizes all your patterns and tells you kind of all the things that are available from like a movement standpoint. And then second, having an enormous exercise library so that you can kind of manipulate and modify positions, right? Similar to what Dan was kind of saying about like shifting the levers and like kind of figure out how to, how to you know, create a different type of stress in a certain area. So having that giant exercise library can really help you kind of slide in and out of that scale of like, all right, where, where is this particular athlete and what's appropriate for this one? Um, and I know we use it a ton in like the performance end of things too. So I, I can definitely see that applying to physical therapy as well. 
Yeah, it's like a systems approach, right? I mean, so that was great. You guys gave some great answers. You guys are wicked smart, right, Len? They, I mean, very smart answers. I'm actually impressed with the answers. You, I think you guys answered it super macro and super amazing. I'm going to give you a, a micro answer and just a quick little answer. And because I think, I think honestly, you may need this too a little bit. You guys were so advanced and so awesome with your answers. How about this? And look, there's room for, you know, there's, there's a little gray here, but keep this in mind. You got one exercise you want to start with someone. You want to know where to load, right? Start with two sets of 10. Yep, that's what we start with. This is what I do, at least. I start with two sets of 10. And then as they're going through it, I immediately say, how's that? Is that easy? Is that moderate? Is that hard? Right? And then based on their feedback, based on what I'm seeing, I'll adjust the weight that day. Hopefully that day, I will try to figure out like a decent weight for them to use. It might take a session or two, right? But a lot of people don't understand intent and they don't understand how to lift things heavy, right? So they think they're struggling a little bit, but then when you quiz them, you're like, hey, was that, was that easy, moderate, hard? They're usually like, ah, oh, that was moderate. And we're like, great, let's go up. Until somebody says like, oh, that was pretty hard. And they look like they're struggling a little bit with the last few reps, we go up. And they're, they're going to be surprised at how strong they get in one session because they start lifting more weight. So same exercise, two sets of 10, find that weight, easy, moderate, hard, right? What do you do from here? I would probably slowly increase their load, linear loading, just each, each session until we start to get to a plateau. I would keep them two to three sets of 10 and let them load, load, load until they keep going up. At some point when they start to plateau, especially with somebody that's new to these exercises, that's when we start manipulating the sets and the reps. That's when we start going down with reps, up in weight, start doing some other variables. But I think in most physical therapy settings, the concept of linear load, which is keep the set and reps the same, but then slowly increase load is very valuable for most people. You know, if you have an advanced trainee, a super aggressive athlete, somebody later down the road, yeah, you have to learn more about this. But starting off, I think it's, it, you can keep it simple and do a lot of damage. Okay. So that would be my advice. And then take everything that all these, these smarter people than me just said, smarter people than me just said, um, and, and put it all together. And then that's some pretty advanced loading strategies or stress strategies, as Dan said too. It's, that's pretty cool. So hopefully that helped. If you have questions like that, head to micronaut.com, click on that podcast link. You can fill out the form to ask us more questions and be sure to rate, review us, iTunes, Spotify, and we will see you on the next episode. Thanks again.